hearts of your faithful. And the kindle of them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall be the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant that by that same Spirit who may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. In the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, the woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for the sins of now and the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. And the Father and the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First of all, just let me say it's been a joy to be with you these few days, and that, as you probably know, I think you know, um, I'm the rector of St. Joseph College Seminary, and as a result of that, um, I'm sending you, because I trust you and your pastor, um, a couple of seminarians this summer, as we typically do. So, when we do that, it's not just about sort of giving them a place to land, although it is that. It's also to make sure that you get a good look at the men that will one day priests, be priests. Because this is kind of a community effort here. Um, you get the priests that you prepare. And so, if you see something that is laudable, tell them. If you see something that's not, tell me. <laughs> And I mean that. I really do mean that. If something is a bit off, especially if it's just, that's just weird. Um, we don't like weird in the priesthood. There's enough weird in the priesthood. Um, just let me know, okay? I'll leave my number. Call me direct. And quickly. All right. Purgatory. Why do we have this thing Called purgatory. As you probably know, it's not a doctrine that the Protestants kept. They pitched it. They tossed it out. And in large part, I feel sorry for them for having done so, because it is the most merciful of doctrines. And when I say that, I don't mean because there's no pain involved in it, but because there's possibility. If the scriptures say that you cannot look upon the face of God and live, if the scriptures say in Revelation that nothing impure comes into the presence of God, can you imagine what your chances are? If you have to die in such a way that every single part of you and everything you've ever done has been purified, sanctified, what are your chances? What are mine? We call those that actually make it straight saints. Now, aside from John, the rest of us are going to have to struggle. <laughs> See, as Lewis once said, if you find a soul at the end of its life with just the slightest coal left, the slightest ember, upon which the Holy Spirit might blow into a conflagration of divine love, then there is hope. Purgatory should not seem to us to be something that is simply a matter, if you will, of due payment. It is that in some ways, but not the way we normally think about it. Our Lord speaks about purgatory with some frequency talking about how you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So there is something about payment. Even the story of Lazarus, when he says, tell Lazarus to dip his finger into water, and, this is the rich man, and dip it onto my tongue to quench my thirst, because I am dying in these flames. And Abraham says, between us and you there has been placed a border. Now, the majority of the fathers of the church see that particular passage not as hell, but as purgatory. Because, you know, there are two kinds of hell in the scriptures. 
What is Gehenna? Genhinol, which we didn't go over yesterday. Do you know what Genhinol means? It's a place just outside of Jerusalem where they used to burn their trash. And so the image that our Lord gives of Gehenna is the place that's constantly burning. It's where we get that idea of a burning hell. And the reason that they burn their trash there is because when they arrive in the Promised Land, that is the place in which the inhabitants, the local inhabitants, sacrificed their children to the demon Moloch. And so the Jews would not touch it. They wouldn't live there. It was only worthy of being trash. And since you're always burning trash in the old days, it's always going up in flames. That sight from Jerusalem of the smoke that's burning outside the city. The other word for hell is Sheol, which is the land of the shades that we shared with other persons across the globe that had some sense about the aftermath, which isn't necessarily the hell of the damned, but the hell in which our Lord descends on Holy Saturday. When it says that he descended into hell, we profess that. He didn't descend into the hell of the damned, but into the hell of those, as it were, who were waiting to be received. That's the old joke, right? When he busts down the doors of Sheol and he gets in there and he sees Adam, Eve, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, everyone alive that was just, etc. And then he sees his father, Joseph. And Joseph says, how was your mother? Right? The first thing he says. I love that idea. I love that idea. The two different kinds of help. But purgatory is not those. What is purgatory? In some sense, you can say that it's a bit more of a state than it is a place, because we're going to talk about heaven, and heaven is very much a place. But as a state, what is purgatory? You know, if you can think back in a time in your life in which you wildly hurt someone, think back to what you would consider your worst sin. And I don't mean that a sin that's private, as it were, quote-unquote, but a sin in which you have really hurt someone, someone that you actually love. Because, you know, you and I don't have contrition. The word contrition means to fracture the heart, literally to tritare, which is to cut into pieces, contrizione, right, to fracture. We never have contrition unless we love, so that when we're going to confession, you know, the grace that we're supposed to receive in the confession, or the first grace, is that of contrition. So it's often the case that when someone is confessing, all of a sudden they get a bit verklempt, as they say. Because that's the moment in which you're receiving the grace to actually be sorry. But I'm only sorry if I love. If I drive out of here, like I typically do, way too fast, and I see those lights going on behind me, I'm not sorry that I sped. I'm sorry that I got caught, right? But if I was driving and I was being stupid and not paying attention and I hurt someone, especially someone if I love them, yes, of course I would have contrition. And so the reason I'm asking you to think about that is that what purgatory is fundamentally, because remember last, yesterday I spoke about the judgment in which you see all of the things you have done, but not just in terms of the way that they have affected you, but the way they've affected everyone else. We call that temporal punishment due to sin. If you ever have one of those really old holy cards and it says 90 days or 150 days, what that does not mean is that you get 150 days off of purgatory. It never meant that. My grandfather, I took him to a CC before he died, and he went through the portiuncula to get the, the plenary indulgence. And he went through it, and then he went through it again. <laughs> and I said, why did that? He goes, well, the first time was for everything I've done. The second time was for everything I will do. <laughs> so kind of a nice Catholic sense, right? But those little things in the prayer cards were not about 90 days off in purgatory. What is a day in purgatory? Because how do you reckon time? Time is a measurement of change. And the only way you can measure change when you don't have a body is you changing interiorly. 
The 90 days had nothing to do with time. It had to do with the kind of merit the saints themselves have given. The saints have merited above and beyond their own need. And so it's as if, as if you prayed that prayer for 90 days, as if you prayed that prayer for 150 days, because the saints are going to join with you. That's a pretty awesome prayer. It has nothing to do with, I'm getting out of jail early. It has to do with conversion. And so the reason I ask the question about someone that you've tremendously hurt, imagine you have to face that. You face it, and you can't do anything about it. You're stuck. Because in this life, please God, we have an opportunity to do something about those things. And you want to do something. You don't want someone to simply forgive you. You want to be able to labor. I want to do something to make it up to you, we say. It's hard. But what if we had the opportunity? And oftentimes, frankly, we do. But not there. We call them poor souls for a reason. It's like the paralytic man who was close to the pool but couldn't get in. He had to be lifted in. Or in the case of all those years not having been lifted in, our Lord had to come and heal him. They're poor because they can no longer merit. Have you heard that Catholic word merit before? I think sometimes, again, it, it gets a bad, a bad connotation for us. Like I've got so many chips on this side, and so many chips on this side, and I'm going to see what the scales are like. Because we want it to be that obvious. We want it to be mathematical. But merit's not quite like that, as we said with the onion. On the contrary, God allows us to merit in the same way. As a child is given praise and honor, when a child does something that they didn't really have much of a hand in. So for example, if you as a father give your child money to get a card and a gift for your wife for Mother's Day, and you take the child to the store, you help them pick out the card and the gift, you wrap it, you get the flowers, you do everything, and the child presents them to the mother, who gets the praise? The child. The child didn't do anything, except that they participate. And that's the way you and I can have merit in this life. And God wants that. Why? Because he wants to be able to say, we should never forget this. He wants to be able to say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Isn't that awesome? That instead of just saving us and saying, okay, you're now made righteous, you're made righteous, you're not, he wants us to participate in our own salvation. And he gives the smallest things we do such huge amounts of merit. But when we leave this life, we can no longer merit. We're poor. I don't care how wealthy you were. I don't care how important you were. It's like the communion rail. Everyone's kneeling down. And you're poor. You have nothing except what you left this life with. And because you have nothing, you have to rely on other people to assist you. And this is kind of the beauty of purgatory. Because not only, as St. Augustine said, God made us without us, but he won't save us without us. So too is it the case that in the mystical body of Christ, you and I can do things to help other members of the body. So you know if you go outside in January here, in Cashew, Sapphire, and it's freezing cold. What's the first part of your body that gets cold? Your nose and your fingers. Why is that? Because your body says you can live without those. And all the blood goes away, right? It goes to protect all the stuff that's important. And in some ways, it's the same sort of idea in the mystical body. You and I can do things in this body to sacrifice, to assist someone else, and even more so with the souls in purgatory. They can't help themselves. They must rely upon our charity, and that's hard. We don't like to rely on other people's charity. We're proud, but that's kind of the point of purgatory. You can't be proud of it. You simply have to receive. So it is a good and holy and just thing to pray for the dead, 
as we see in 2 Maccabees 12, 46. It's one of the reasons the Protestants got rid of that book. Because it's a direct line of purgatory in that book. Why would you pray for them unless you can do something for them? But it also means that we should never say, I wish I had done X, I wish I had done X, Y, Z, before someone died. That may be true, but you can do something now. We're not cut off. And my love for them should spur me on to do something, to have holy masses offered. And I don't care if you give five or ten dollars, you don't even have to give anything. I can say that just so Father Brown doesn't get a lot of stipends. <laughs> it's about offering the mass, offering your rosary, offering your prayers, consistently. Don't ever assume that someone is in heaven. I always pray for the priest that needs it the most that I don't know. Because at some point he's going to get in. And at some point he's going to assist me. Because I'm going to be the priest that everyone forgot to be stuck there. Right? We need charity, the mystical body. It's also considered by St. Catherine of Genoa, if you ever want to read about purgatory, she was the saint that had the most visions about purgatory. And so powerfully that the church took her doctrine under herself as a true description purgatory, which might not be what you think it to be. She does say that it's the most intense pain you will ever experience. And she also says it's also the most intense joy at the same time. How is that possible? For the same reason I mentioned, if you knew someone that you hurt and you had to face it and they forgave you, there's a two-fold movement going on there. There's the shame of what you've done and how pathetic you are, and the joy of having communion restored. And as St. Thomas says, to the extent to which you're healed is the extent to which that burning, that fire, lessens. It's a crushing cycle of love. There's a wonderful poem I mentioned the other day, The Dream of Gerontius. That whole thing is about purgatory. If you've never read it, it's, it's an easy read, incredible poem about the old man that dies. And he's talking to his angel as before he goes before the Lord about that experience. And the angel says, understand what you are about to do. You are about to encounter the Lord who has been crucified for you. But the very sight of him will wound you even as it heals. And the moment that the angel comes before the Son of God in his humanity, standing there. The soul, as it were, shoots out of the hands of the angel, impelled by love alone, because he's seen the object that he has always loved and never knew. And on the halfway there, he gets there, and he gets burned and shriveled up, and he's lying inert on the ground. As the angel said, the sight of him the shame at having seen yourself for what you are and the joy of having seen him are two pains so counter and so keen. They exist at the same time. If you've ever had, for example, a massive amount of light about anything in terms of who you are and what you are, it's kind of like that. It's such a joy to see myself as I really am if I'm seeing the Lord and his love at the same time. If I only see myself as I really am, that's a cause for despair. If I only see the Lord without seeing myself as I really am, it's a cause of presumption. It's the reason those two things have to go together. But they burn. They hurt. And that's why I said the confession is the sacrament of self-knowledge. It's the place in which you and I get practice in seeing ourselves truly, so that when I see him in the afterlife, I'm not running away, because the pain is too much. When the angel speaks after the soul is kind of shriveled up there on the ground, burnt by the sight of Christ, the angel says in all these sort of glorious words about now has his true eternal life begun. And he picks him up 
and he dips him into the penal waters of purgatory. So in the, this poem, the fire is just having seen, the light of seeing Jesus. And then he's got to get healed. And so he's dipped into the penal waters. And the angel says to him at the end, Sing now your soft and sad strain, and I will come and wake you on the morn. You know, I'll just come get you tomorrow, and you'll be healed. It's a beautiful description, and I recommend it to every one of you. Do souls that have died show up at all? You all know people that have died. Do they ever show up? Yes, certainly. There was a priest in Washington, D.C., who died. And it was when I was there. And one of my professors, who was a very astute old Dominican, was kind of renowned for his knowledge of the spiritual life, and he got a call one day from the Archdiocese saying, we don't know what to do. What do you mean? Well, the priest at such and such a parish has been saying Mass there in the morning. And Father said, why would that be weird? Isn't that what priests do? Yes, it would be quite normal, except for the fact that he died last week. And he kept showing up, and parishioners saw him saying Mass at that altar. And so the astute priest that they called said, go to his rectory and find all the Mass intentions he didn't fulfill. And so he did. And he wasn't a bad priest, he was just a forgetful, um, unorganized priest. And in every little nook and cranny of his rectory was like a $10 bill rolled up with an intention. And he just forgot to ever do any of them. He took them and just put them somewhere. And so it was that they had all these intentions. And they filed them out to priests across the diocese and across the country to some degree. And when the last Mass was said, he stopped showing up. I'm leaving in my will as much money as I ever have to make sure that priests say all the mass intentions that I forgot to say. I'm not getting stuck because of that. <laughs> but they do show up. They do show up. And sometimes you want them to show up to you. Right? You want some sort of sign, some sort of thing that says, I made it. And I think that they do. On the one hand, we think to ourselves, why wouldn't you come back and talk to me? Obviously, they can only do what our Lord allows them to do. But I think C.S. Lewis once said very astutely about his wife, why would she be thinking about me? And that's a hard thing to figure out, right? Especially that if you've lived with someone for so long, but they haven't entered into, presumably, the joy of the Lord. He is their love. And there's a certain letting go on that. Because in heaven we are not married or given in marriage. Which doesn't mean you're not going to know your spouse. This isn't some impersonal weirdness. Now we're going to get into heaven. Because I think that you and I have had bad thoughts about heaven, or at least abstract thoughts about heaven, and it ceases to pull us. We don't get attracted to it because we think about it in the wrong way. So imagine if you thought about heaven... <laughs> What's the color of heaven in your mind? White. Why white? I guess because we have been washed in the blood of the land, we wear albs, we wear servers albs, and whatever else. We think about white, pure, clean, boring. <laughs> white is beautiful if it has something to contrast with. But in itself, it's just antiseptic. I don't want to live in a doctor's office my whole eternity. No offense, Doc. <laughs> Why were colors made? Why all the various spectrums and spectrums you and I have not even had capacity to see? What about sounds and all the things you and I can hear, and yet we're only catching a very small glimpse or wave of what sound could be? Why do we think about it in such abstract terms? Jesus raised his body. He walked around. They put their fingers into his hands and into his side. He ate fish and bread. It's a place for people with bodies. We should never ever think about heaven as something less than this world. On the contrary, you must think about it as, I have never seen an actual tree. 
what a real tree is, I've only seen a shadow. It's a bit platonic if you ever studied philosophy, but it's true. Jesus says, through his servant Paul, eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love him. Well, why hasn't I seen? Why hasn't ear heard? Because you can't. On the one level, you think to yourself, why didn't you tell us more about heaven? You spoke about hell so many times. Tell us more about heaven. Hell you know. Hell you can experience in this life. Purgatory you can experience in this life. Heaven, not so much. I have a trick question for the guys when they come to seminary. I ask the seminarians, what is happiness? And they try, they try to answer, of course. And because they're trying to be religious, right, they go through the usual answers and say, it's not that. Just like Aristotle did, just like every other philosopher did. Okay, it's not honor, it's not money, it's not power, it's not pleasure, it's not fame. They go through the usuals. But they can never tell me what it is. And so if they've read Aristotle, they come up with something like, to contemplate the highest truth. Well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and again, that's what you do sitting there thinking about heaven. When you think about the beatific vision, I mean, the only thing you oftentimes we can come up with is, you see that? Yeah, you? I'm looking at it. You? Yeah, I see it. Now what? don't have any idea what happiness is fundamentally because you don't have any real idea of who God is. You literally have no concept of the true God. Now what do I mean by that? You mean he spent all this time to reveal himself and I have no true concept of God? Think about it like this. Any concept that I have, any concept I have, has come through my encounter with the world. I have burned away that material. I have understood the form or the essence of the thing to some degree, and I've got it. But I cannot do that with a finite mind, with an infinite being. I've never encountered him like that. I've encountered him in the scriptures that I've read, in the grace that I've received, in the persons through whom he has spoken, but I don't know the essence of God. I've not seen him. Another trick question I ask the guys is, why can't you see God? And they come up with all sorts of wonderful moral reasons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very simple answer. He doesn't have a body. There's nothing that your senses can pick up. He has no body except in his Son, Jesus Christ, who has assumed to himself a human nature. But God's essence has no body. So what are you going to do with your senses that only pick up matter? In five different ways. That's all I've got to encounter the world. So, this is going to be a little tricky. 30 seconds of heart, and we'll go back to something more easy. You ready? What if... Think about someone that you love, just for a moment. Think about the person that you love. And you're thinking about all their qualities, their characteristics, their face, their whatever, their, your, your memories of them, your past with them, whatever else. What if all of a sudden, when you were thinking about that person in your mind, let's assume the person's not even here. You're thinking about that person, and all of a sudden, as you're thinking about them, they respond to you. You're trying to look at them in your mind's eye, but they're looking at you. This is what St. Thomas calls the lumen gloria, the light of glory. That instead of generating a concept of God, because whatever concept I generate is finite, no matter what it is, I, I can't understand omniscience, I can't understand infinity, I can't understand omnipotency. I can't grasp that. I'm finite. My mind is finite. But what if, instead of me generating a concept, he just lives as the concept in my mind? He takes over 
my knowing. And I see him as he really is, presenting himself to my mind in such a way that I never lose him. I always see him. And yet seeing him, I, I can't see him completely in so far as I comprehend him. I will never comprehend God. The word comprehension means you wrap your arms around something. Comprehend it is to grab it, to grasp it. I will never do that. Who would I have to be to comprehend God? God. There's one person that comprehends God. That's the Son. That's why He's the Son. And there's one other person who comprehends them both, and He is the Holy Spirit. That's why He's the Holy Spirit. You will never do that, but you will swim in his infinitude. You will see him. St. Thomas says, totum sed non totaliter, which means you'll see all of him, and yet not totally. Like standing on the shore of a beach and seeing all of the ocean out there, and you can inspect any part of it, but it's since he has no parts, you see the whole thing, and you can't comprehend it. And so you can always go further and further and further. You're never going to be bored. It's not like some sort of static staring at, a, at an image. Well, it was nice for the first 5,000 years, but I'm getting kind of bored now. <laughs> you can't exhaust it. It's impossible to exhaust, and you also can't lose it. But the reason he gives us no real knowledge of what that's like is because he can't. The only thing he can do is have you see it. But you have to be in such a way in which you can see it. No one sees God and lives, and nothing impure comes into the presence of God. So until you are at the point where you can see it and not close yourself off in absolute fear of its infinitude, of its beauty, of its goodness, of its truth, you can't, he won't let himself be seen. He lets himself be seen by shadows, by images by analogies, by movements. He's not hiding. You and I have been hiding since the garden. But if he manifests himself to you, you will hide further. He can only manifest himself to you in so far as you can receive it. And that is a matter of divine love. That's why you have this life, as long as you have it, to get you ready to see him. So, the old analogy, it's not mine, but I do like it, that does somewhat approximate why this is so hard for us. Imagine you are in your mother's womb, and you're a twin. Let's say your twin's name is Bob, just because I like the name Bob, right? So you're sitting there in the womb, and Bob says to you, you know, I, I heard that this isn't the only life. And you're like, yeah, whatever. Propaganda, wishful thinking. It's nice in here. It's quiet, it's dark, it's warm. And Bob says, but I, I heard someone say today, I heard somewhere, it was kind of muffled, but I heard it. It said something about Skipping. What's skipping? I don't know. I heard something about climbing. What's climbing? I don't know. Running, jumping, dancing, laughing. How would you translate those words to someone in the womb? If you had the use of your intellect, how would you convey what it's like to put your face in the sun and feel its warmth? How do you convey that to anyone? What would you say to them? If you were drawing inside the womb, you had a piece of paper and a pen, and you drew a tree, or you drew a landscape, how would that convey to them what it's actually like? Shadows and images, but not the truth. And when you came forth, and you began to experience those things, what a real tree is like, what running is like, what laughter is like. Would you ever want to go back? 
Would you ever want to try to go back to a dark, warm place because it's safe? Because it's what you knew before? No one wants to come back from heaven. They don't even think about it. But it's true to say that just as it would be impossible to explain that to someone in the womb, so is it impossible for you and I to have any concept of what God has prepared for those who love him. But it's not the kind of place for persons without bodies. He made it. It's for a place with persons with bodies. And two people at least have those bodies there now. One is the Son of God, and one is the Blessed Mother. I don't want to be in a spiritual place, much less a place where everything's white, and I wear a white toga, and I got a harp. I'm not interested. But also don't reduce it to stupid things you love now. When I say stupid, I mean that. I've heard too many times at funerals, dumb things. Well, he's all the 19th green. No, he's not. <laughs> he's riding his hog in heaven. No, he's not. If you hear a Harley hog on the other side, you didn't make it. <laughs> don't reduce it because you're not going to be attracted by it. The only thing you can do now is get those moments of grace where you're enjoying something that's genuinely beautiful and good, or you're in prayer and you have this movement, this surge of love to say, that's just a prelibatio, a foretaste. It's just a sip of what I'm going to drink in in the torrent of divine love. I want that. If you've ever had a moment in prayer where you were actually taken, where your senses and your mind were fixed and raptured, if you haven't had it, keep working at it. I guarantee you want to die. You don't think about anything else. What did St. Peter say when he saw our Lord? Just his humanity transfigured, not even his divinity. Just on that mountain, so his humanity transfigured. It is good that we are here. I'll build three tents. I don't need one. I just want to stare. Because this is the problem with the kind of beauty you and I encounter now. Beauty has that quality of so pulling us, evoking from us desire and longing. But it's also painful. Isn't it? Anything you hear that's really beautiful in terms of music it's painful. Anything you see in terms of a sunset over the mountains, it's beautiful, but it's painful. And why is it painful? Because you can't keep it. It's like you're being invited to look through a window at something that's going on, but you've not been invited inside. It's slipping away. Every single beauty that you encounter. C.S. Lewis says that it's like unto that kind of wedding banquet, like unto that kind of beauty, like unto that kind of festival at which I'm standing on the other side of a window and no one minds me. No one invites me in. And so while I enjoy it, I'm not part of it. But he says there's a rustle in the leaves of all of creation that suggests that one day I'm going to get in. And I'm never going to leave. So, much work to do. On yourself, on me, on your brothers and sisters, because time is very short. But should you do it, should you be rewarded with the capacity and the enjoyment of God for all eternity? When you die, it will be something like this. I read this one time, and I'm going to read it to you because I just love it. If you've spent yourself for Jesus Christ, for his honor and glory, and for the most holy trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, listen to this. Oh, the Lord cannot forget that the saints, when they once lived on earth, paid homage to him by the total donation of their repose, their happiness, and their whole being that they would have liked to have had inexhaustible flow of blood in their veins in order to shed it as a living and imperishable pledge of their faith. 
that they would have desired a thousand hearts in their breasts, so as to consume them in the unquenchable fires of their love, and to possess a thousand bodies in order that they might deliver them to Margaret like victims, unceasingly renewed. And what will God say to those souls when the grateful God says to them, now it's my turn? Meaning, you've done this for me, now let me show you what I can do. Let me give to you what is in my omnipotent power to give to you. You've done all that. Now it's my turn. I always think about that with the Blessed Mother. Imagine when she's assumed into heaven. You know, she has her dormition. Whether it's an actual death or not, we don't know. But she's assumed into heaven. Can you imagine what it's like for her son to have prepared that place for her and to bring her there simply because he wants her there with that kind of infinite love and gratitude that even God has in the Son for what Our Lady had done for him. Imagine when he says to her, open your eyes. How good would that be? As the Carmelites say, in just a little while, it will be eternity. So, if I do not see you again, in this life, and I may not the way I drive, <laughs> I bid you God speed, and I do hope to see you there, if not here. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, and is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed afternoon, and a great being with you. I will hear confessions again if anyone wants to.